2 Corinthians chapter 2. We begin our study in verse 5. I want to begin reading in verse 1. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 1. So I have made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to me, or excuse me, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Now verse 5. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you, to some extent, not to put it too severely. Sin causes grief. It causes long-term grief to the one who sinned, and the longer one waits to repent, the more severe grief they will feel, too, by the way. But it also causes short-term grief to those around them. Sin is a pain, which is why sin must be dealt with. Especially, specifically in this chapter it's talking about, in the church, with, with Christians. It has to be dealt with. Verse 6, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now, there was a sinning Christian in Corinth who did very despicable things, immoral things. But the church in Corinth loved that sinning Christian there enough to punish him. No, not physical punishment. God doesn't ever tell us to do that with other Christians. But it means means that they cut him off. It meant making sure that he understood that it could not be business as usual until he repented. And they did that. And he repented, and the mission was accomplished. Verse 7. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. When a person repents, they need to be forgiven and they need to be accepted. The purpose for discipline should never be to get even. When you're talking about Christian discipline, it's never to get even. Its purpose is to bring the sinner back to Christ. And if they are not forgiven and they are not accepted after they repent, that could destroy them spiritually. Verse 8. says, I urge you therefore to reaffirm your love for him. Christians must keep in mind all the times they have sinned and all the times they have confessed and were immediately restored into fellowship with God. If all those times of forgiveness are remembered, all those times they receive forgiveness are remembered, then they are less likely to be unforgiving themselves. They will not act superior because they will know they're not superior. Verse 9. The reason I wrote you uh, was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient and everything. Now, if we let a sinner in our life, one who claims to be a Christian, go on and on and never say a word and never make it clear that God says they are wrong, then we are being disobedient to God by not confronting them. If we hold a grudge and treat someone who has repented as if they were a second-class Christian, we disobey God as well. Both are wrong. Ten. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. If that person in Corinth, that sinning Christian, repented, and he did, 
and therefore was forgiven by those whose he if, whose sin affected most then Paul would forgive him as well. More importantly, Christ have, has forgiven them. Jesus forgives repenting sinners. Always does. And God's people should echo God's forgiveness by telling the sinner that he is clean. It's very important for a sinning Christian to hear that. That's how you reaffirm their faith. Verse 11, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Satan is a schemer. And he is always looking for ways to discredit Christianity. If a Christian is allowed to sin, and nothing is ever said, he will accuse the church of not having any standards, of not being holy. If a repenting Christian is not fully forgiven, and not fully accepted, the devil will say, See, the church has no compassion. And so, you see, it's very, very important to handle all situations biblically so that we do not give Satan fuel for slander. Twelve. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, Paul went, in this this case he went to Troas, but Paul went where he went to do what God called him to do. He went where he went so that he could fulfill his call, which was to preach the gospel. And what is true for Paul is true for all of us, in a sense, because we never punch out as Christians. We are always on duty for Jesus Christ. We are where we are to represent Jesus. At the very least, we are all expected to be a good testimony to the Lord by our actions and also by our words, if possible. 13. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Wrong chapter. He says in verse 12, Now, when I went to Troas, the gospel of Christ, and found that the Lord had opened the door for me. Now, we already read this verse. But verse 13 flows right with it. I still had no peace of mind. So he was preaching the word of God, but he still had no peace of mind. Peace of mind. And that's kind of unusual because when you're doing God's will, you usually have peace. But, but there was something lacking here. And, and we know why in the last part of verse 13. Because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Now, it is good that Paul had an open door to teach God's word. And like I said, that's a source of joy for the person who's called to teach. Just like it's a source of joy for you to be in God's will, to be obedient to Him. However, Paul's concern for the Corinthians' spiritual life sort of stole his joy. See, he was waiting for Titus. Titus was going to meet him in Troas. He was waiting for Titus to show up with feedback on how that letter to Corinth, the first letter to Corinth, was received. And until he knows how it was received, all those rebukes, all those corrections, until he knows if the Corinthians have repented or not, he just does not have peace. And that's how it goes. Because if you love God, I mean, you, you may have it pretty good yourself, but if you love God, it is tough if those you care about do not love God because you know what waits them if they do not change. 14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal possession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. Success does not mean we get everything we want. The way it doesn't mean that. That is how the world measures success. But that is not how Jesus measures success. There's nothing wrong with that. It would be great. But real success means we are faithful to Christ, and we represent Him well, And we leave the results to him, actually. Verse 15. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Now, we are, we Christians, if we're walking with the Lord, we are an aroma of Christ to the saved and the unsaved. 
to those who will be saved and those who will not be saved. We are an aroma of Christ. Think about this. You may enjoy the fragrance of fresh cut grass, right? First time somebody cuts their grass in the spring, that always is such a nice fragrance. You may enjoy that while someone else with allergies will sneeze 20 times and be absolutely miserable. Same fragrance, different responses, different people. Well, it's that way with Christ. If we as Christians live for Jesus and we speak the word of God, some are going to be drawn to Christ, others will be repelled. Same Jesus, same word, same holiness, different people, different responses. But one thing's for sure. You live for Jesus. You speak the truth. Both groups, whether they repel, they are repelled by Christ or they receive Christ, both groups will know that the Spirit of Jesus Christ has been in their midst. 16. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? You give the word of God to someone who rejects it, and they will not they will not walk away feeling good about you or Jesus or the Word of God. You live holy, you give the word of God to somebody who is rejecting Jesus Christ, they will not walk away feeling good. In fact, a fearful spiritual cloud of death and doom and conviction will be on them. And they're going to feel it to some degree. Meanwhile, you give the word of God to someone who does receive it, and they will have joy, and they will have pleasure, like that that you receive from the sweet smell of blossoms in the spring. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing to experience. So, again, same Lord, same word of God, different responses. To one, it's repulsive. To another, who's receiving Jesus, it's wonderful. It's the best thing that ever happened to them. 17. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. The only preachers who will boldly speak the truth of God's word are those who are not in it for popularity or as a career or worse yet to get rich. The reason God used Paul to clearly separate God's people from those who are not is because, is because Paul gave the straight truth. You see that? If a preacher is preaching the word of God, the people who hear him will either conform to God's word or they will leave. But they will not stick around and feel uncomfortable. It's the way it's always been. Hebrews talks about the Word of God being a sharp, two-edged sword that separates and divides. Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And that's what the truth does. To one, we are a fragrance of life. To others, we are a fragrance of death. Now let's go into chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some recommendation to you or from you? The false teachers that by now you know were in Corinth, they came in after Paul left. They show up in Corinth with all sorts of official credentials. All four sorts of official papers, credentials, which said that they were ministers. Well, big deal. Who cares? They had the papers. They had, you know, the credentials written on paper. But they were spiritually dead. And all they did was lead people away from a simple devotion to Christ and a simple devotion to truth. Papers or not, it didn't matter. They're useless. Paul had his credentials, too. They were not written on paper. They were signed by the Holy Spirit and they were validated by the changed lives of those that he taught the word of God to. That's, that's the credentials of the Apostle Paul. Spiritual credentials. Verse 2. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, 
known and read by everybody. In other words, changed lives are proof of the working of God's Holy Spirit. The new birth is real. Christians are different than other people. Christians are different than what they used to be, especially if they become Christians at a later age. No one has changed from the inside out and truly wants to become more like Christ unless the Spirit of God is working on them through the Word of God. That can only be done. That kind of a change can only be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And so, changed lives are proof of the working of God's Holy Spirit. Verse 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Before he says any more, Paul gives credit to Jesus for any holiness in the Corinthian Christians. I don't want anybody to think that he's taking credit himself. He gives credit to Jesus. Christians, Christians are Christians because Jesus worked on their heart. And Christians, to the degree that they are holy, are holy because Jesus Christ has made them holy. The law of God was written on the souls of the Corinthians. And the love of God was in their souls. And that doesn't happen just because a sinner decides that he wants it to happen. It takes the power of God to give him the want to, and it takes the power of God to make it happen. Verse 4. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. The only reason Paul can say that he is a true minister of God is because Jesus Christ is working through him. It had nothing to do with education or his intellect or his talent. Never does. Never. People can put out a good show. And they can even draw a lot of people to him with their sparkle. But that, that doesn't prove that they are a real minister of God. If Jesus does not fill us and work through us, then no one can be drawn to God through us. And the more full we are of Christ, the more Christ will work through us. Five. Not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. We are only as good as the grace of Almighty God makes us good. We cannot make ourselves good. And we sure cannot make others good. We, we cannot be persuasive and slick enough to change somebody's heart. Oh, we can train people to do what is right through a system of rewards and punishments, but that's not what we're talking about here. Only God can change a person from the inside and give them a desire to please Jesus. That is what the new birth accomplishes. Six. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The covenant, or the agreement, the deal, that Christians have with God, is is a new deal. But it does not keep God's law or go to hell. Thankfully, it does not keep God's law or go to hell. That would be a waste of time. That kind of a deal would be a waste of time. If that was the agreement, then God might as well just send us to hell right away. Because we all break it. Our agreement with God is, repent, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and be saved. That's the kind of deal that we can handle. Verse 7. Now, If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, Moses' face literally glowed as he talked with God on Mount Sinai and received the law. And when he came down, it glowed too. It was so bright that the Israelites couldn't even look at him. That's the glory that came with the giving of God's law. 
And that law didn't even lead to eternal life, but rather eternal death, because the people could not obey it. Now, read verses 7 and 8 together. It says, Now instead, whoops, sorry, I'm in the wrong time, or I'm having a hard time sticking to the right chapter here. Now it's the ministry that brought death, which is engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? The giving of God's law came with divine glory when Moses' face lit up. So, what in the world kind of glory occurs when God himself enters a sinner who repents and receives Jesus? What kind of glory would accompany that? A moral glory. That's what kind. A glory that changes a rotten person who never cared about God into a godly person who with all of their heart wants to be good and wants to please their creator. That's the kind of glory that occurs. Now again, especially if a person doesn't come to Christ until a little later on in life. Verse 9. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. A lot of words there. I'll sum it up for you. The Israelites thought that it was a big deal when Moses' face lit up. And it was a big deal. I mean, it certainly showed that God was at work. That sort of thing doesn't just happen by accident. But that whole thing with Moses' face lighting up like that, that whole thing is remarkable. Remarkable as it was, seems pretty small when you compare it to what Jesus did, how he died to pay for our sins. Moses did good by receiving the commandments. Jesus did a lot better by paying for our sins and the sins we committed because we did not obey those commandments. Verse 11. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Moses' face eventually faded. And so does one of the purposes of the law that God gave him. One of the purposes of the law fades away too. The perfect standard that God sets forth in his law reveals to us that we fall short and makes us understand that we need the Savior Jesus. Well, that purpose for the law fades away. That purpose of bringing us to Christ fades away when we humble ourselves and cry out to God for mercy through Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. In other words, Paul knew that what he was saying was true, which is why he said what he said about Christ with boldness. And that is what I love about God's Word. It is true. It always will be true. You can speak it, you can live it, and you can know that it is correct and it always will be correct. 13. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Moses' face was veiled to the people so they could not see God's glory on him. But so was God's solution to man's sin. It was veiled to the, to the Israelites also. But we are not like them. We are not veiled like them. We know we are not veiled because Jesus has come, Jesus has gone, and in between, He paid for our sins on the cross. We can boldly stand up and say, Jesus paid for our sins. He's the only road to heaven because we're not veiled. We know the truth. 14. But their minds were made dull For to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed. Because only in Christ is it taken away. Paul makes a comparison here. 
Moses' face was veiled to the Jews. And when the scriptures concerning Jesus are read, even today, there seems to be a veil over their spiritual eyes. They just don't get it. Even though it's crystal clear. Even though Jesus fulfilled all the scriptures regarding the Messiah, they just don't get it. It's a form of spiritual blindness. And the Bible says that when someone does not love the truth, they will believe a lie. 15. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. See, without the Holy Spirit revealing the meaning of God's word, it cannot be understood. The Jews read the Old Testament and God's law. I should say they read the Old Testament and God's law. And they think, oh yes, we have to keep it real good in order to be saved. They are veiled. They do not see that the law was given, at least in part, to show us that we need God's mercy through the Savior and we can't keep it good enough. They're veiled. They don't see it. But notice verse 16. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When a person repents, turns from their sin, and calls on Christ to save them, everything becomes clear. The Word of God begins to jump out. It begins to make sense. Repentance and faith is essential for discernment. Until people are willing to face the truth and accept the truth, regardless of what it means for them, they will not understand the truth. 17. Now, the Spirit, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom in Jesus Christ. Not freedom to sin, but freedom from the heavy burden of trying to be good enough to work your way to heaven on your own. That's the kind of liberty there is in Christ. 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We stare at Jesus spiritually. We spend time with Jesus in the Word, in prayer. We become more like Jesus. His reflection reflects off onto us and we become more and more like Him. The more of God's Word we put in us, the more the mind of Christ will fill us, and the more that happens, the more like Christ we will be. And so, here's the thing to remember. Holiness is a natural byproduct of being filled with Jesus. It is not a result of striving in our own energy to keep God's law. Next time, chapter 4. Until then, so long everyone.